It's so great to be here. Um, uh, Namahi kite kai fakahari to the organisers for inviting us. It's really great to be here and be able to hear all these things that are going on. I was just commenting to someone how actually I didn't know very many people here and we're all doing very interesting things. So it's really great to be able to bring us together. So I'm taking a shift now. I am in the National Science Challenge here, you can see, Building Better Homes, Towns and Cities, but I am just going to come right out and say I'm not a scientist. <laughs> um, and what that means for me as a human geographer is I'm really interested in questioning the way that we think about things and using the data that scientists might come up with or that people using quantitative survey methods might come up with and thinking <coughs> about what does that tell us about what we know, how we know and how we might do things differently. How, how might we imagine um, a different sort of um, ecological and social environment here in Ōtautahi or other parts of the country. So I'm uh, going to talk briefly about a project I've been involved in um, for the National Science Challenge, um, try and connect it to the urban restoration kaupapa that we've been talking about today. Uh, and then I'm going to delve into thinking about care. Care's come up a few times already. We've had cues to care. Uh, we've talked about who's going to care for the kinds of plantings that are put in place. Is it council responsibility? We've talked about plantings on, on private land and Cody um, care for Cody on private land as well. So there is a, a whole lot of care that's going on when we're talking about urban restoration. So I am a human geographer that specialises in the study of care. So that's where we're going to go. Uh, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the idea of commons as a framework for thinking about care. So it moves us away from thinking about that dichotomy of public-private. And it starts to think about what are the groups of people that come together to common a piece of land, however it's owned, in order to care for it together. And then to come back to thinking a little bit about what does this mean for urban restoration. So our project overview. Um, basically, uh, Grade and Diprose and I started off with this um, organisation called Cultivate. How many of you have heard of Cultivate Christchurch? So a good bunch of you have. So it's an organisation in the, uh, partly based in Peterborough Street uh, in the centre of the city uh, on privately owned land. They have got a rolling contract through life and vacant spaces and they're growing vegetables on this land using uh, organic methods. Um, but what's interesting about them from a care perspective is they're actually doing this with the help um, of youth interns. So young people who, um, who are coming alongside, um, often people who might have identified a mental health need or been in the justice system somehow, or just not really knowing what to do uh, after they've left school. So young people between about 16 and 21 years old are working there. And it was started by a social worker and an ecologist. Uh, so there is a real mental health aspect to the whole farm. Um, they have uh, three social workers employed most of the time. Uh, one B, who you can see there, who's a founder, and then others that come in and do different roles, uh, working alongside young people um, as they work on the farm. So it's a really nice way of being alongside someone when you're working farming. You can have some really good um, chats with people that aren't this sort of direct, like I'm being counselled sort of approach. So they really come at it from a well-being perspective there too. But they're also delivering sort of ecological well-being as well. So they're collecting um, waste from the inner city, so from restaurants where it's not, um, doesn't have council green waste, and they're collecting that by e-bike, they're composting it, and they're <coughs> growing food on it, this land that they've built up there in Peterborough Street, and you can kick the soil and you can find food scraps underneath, they've literally built it up with actual food scraps even before composting. Um, and they grow food and it's sold back to restaurants, or if you get an Ubi box or something like that, you might be eating this already. So that's the uh, organisation, and we just visited them as part of another project, and we're like, that's so cool, we want to get money and come back and just study them because it's super great. So our project objectives were to really understand the role of the material, the physical, and the social commons in youth wellbeing, um, in particular at Cultivate, to document their process of doing this common work on the land of Peterborough Street and Paulswell sites uh, in order that they could share it with others. And down here, which is the main part of our project that I'm not really going to talk about today, is developing a community economy return on investment tool where we help uh, community organisations see whether all of the time and energy that they're investing in something is bringing the outcomes that they really desire. So we work with them on developing that. 
our methods were uh, ethnography or also known as participant observation or I put it here participatory observation because I went and gardened with them one day a week uh, for a semester um, not quite six months at the end because I got pregnant and had a baby in the middle of that um, and that meant just me coming alongside gardening doing whatever everyone else was doing uh, we interviewed all of the staff and interns in the summer of 2018 with my the rest of my team and we held three workshops, one with staff, one with staff and interns, and one with urban designers at the end of last year. And so in all of those, we collected information um, about the organisation. So the next two slides, I'm just going to really, really briefly present a couple of findings from that before I go on to talking about care. So one of the reasons care came out as a key theme is because I'm interested in it, but another reason it came out is because you just couldn't get away from it. The staff kept focusing and talking about how much they cared for their youth um, as individuals and as a group of young people, and also how much they cared for the farm as a place, um, as, a, as a sort of um, ecological spot in the city, and how much they cared in a wider scale for the land and the community around them. So very um, idealistic people. There's a few organic farmers employed there um, who are really interested in caring for the land. When we interviewed the youth, they were really focused on, I don't know if they were focused on developing self-care as much as they kept talking about how much their self-care had improved. So things like uh, learning to eat breakfast before you came to work, like that came through with all of the youth as being a super important thing that they learned from the staff. Um, and also the benefits of a therapeutic environment, which is what I'm going to focus on in the next slide. So one of the things we did in the interviews with the young people was to ask them about their relationship with the physical and social environment at Cultivate. Um, and here's some of the things that they mentioned. So um, in the end, all of the youth that we interviewed were Pākehā youth um, coming out of a, uh, mostly broken homes and mostly sort of a little bit unsure about what to do next um, in life. But they felt like Cultivate provided them this breathing room, a sense of home, it reduced their stress, a sense of satisfaction by doing meaningful work, but also some of the boring work gave them a sense of satisfaction. So one guy said, look, you can look down the row and you can see I started there, I've done all of that and I got to here and I finished that and it gave them a real sense of I achieved something and I can see what I achieved. Uh, another uh, young girl talked about um, the value of pricking out plants, so taking the plants and sort of putting them into a little pot and that was sort of a meditative kind of process for her that she could really concentrate on that and not think about what was going on at home uh, or anything else. And, and their knowledge about food, plants and healthy eating. So a lot of them mentioned I'd never really eaten vegetables before and they're not that bad actually, so that was quite interesting. I could identify a few more than I could before, so that was cool. So to connect this project to urban restoration, it's not about indigenous um, flora, so what am I doing here? What am I talking about? How does this connect to what you're doing? Um, I have put an indigenous one there, yeah. So you can see uh, from some views, these are not the views that are normally put on the website, it can look a bit industrial. This is the Peterborough site looking towards the um, healthcare centre next door. Um, maybe not so green spacey. Um, but also the other side looking towards Manchester Street, you have this beautiful kitchen garden and open to the street there so people can walk past and see it. So one of the values that came out was really connecting with the community and making a green space that was not valued, not just valuable for the people working there, but the people walking past. And they said there's an uh, elderly guy that comes past every few days and says, oh, I don't have a garden anymore. It's so nice to walk past here and see your garden. And eventually came and started volunteering there. <laughs> yeah, not so much on the indigenous um, flora, but definitely little pockets of it there as well. Um, but I think what came up, out for us was the way in which young people started to even be able to make those associations, right? To be able to identify between a strawberry and a hebe or whatever it was that you were trying to identify. So that actually came out as a sort of way of making connections with a particular place. And there's a lot of research by geographers that talks about how it's your connection with one place uh, that makes a difference in your environmental sensibilities. Because in that one place you can notice change, you can notice climate change effects, you can notice um, pollution effects and you become attached um, to one place. So that idea of place attachment really came through in the interviews, particularly with the Peterborough site. The Hallsville site's a little bit barren and much more hardcore um, 
uh, agricultural sort of approach there. You've got to have your gum boots and your swan dry. But here there was a sense that this was a beautiful place that we're attached to. You could notice, oh, this is coming through here. Uh, and that was important for well-being. So the next thing I want to shift to, and I noticed this morning that despite there being a lot of um, people who, who study um, material things, like, you know, plants and, and fauna here, there is quite a human-centered approach to the way that we're talking about things. So there has been a big shift in geography recently to talk about how do we shift away from always understanding humans to be the center of things and to think about how actually uh, we're just one sort of species in a very complex ecosystem, one that's caused a lot of damage, obviously, but we're not the only thing that's going on here. Um, and obviously we've talked about ecosystem services, which is another way of saying uh, the environment cares for us, right? Not cares for us as in it loves us and is so happy with us for being here, but cares for us and it's offering care as, a, as an action. It's acting in a care way, uh, which is a different way of saying it's serving us. Yeah. So these are all different words that we use to describe the same thing. So I don't know if any of you remember Care Bears. I was never allowed one, but you know, still regretting that. Um, when we talk about care, we're not necessarily talking about the fluffy pink kind of um, I love you sort of care here, but we're talking about what Tronto calls a species that you <coughs> see on the left here that includes everything that we do to maintain, continue and repair our world so that we can live in it as well as possible. So that's a really nice definition of care that provides space for us to be thinking about all kinds of activities that we do. So we're talking about care here as an action, uh, not as a feeling. <coughs> she defines care in these different ways. The first one's a bit more about a feeling. I care about the environment. Okay, I care about the environment, but I still, you know, or whatever, pollute um, regularly. Caring for is getting into that more action where we start actually doing something that produces an effect. Uh, caregiving, where you're really going all out there to give some kind of care to whatever it is. This is not just about environment, obviously. Care receiving, which is when you experience the receipt of care from something. Uh, and then in more recent times, she's come up with this other concept called caring with. And that comes out of much more deep thinking around what does it mean to care in a non-patronizing way, right? So often care is something we kind of impose on other people. We impose it on young people or we impose it on um, groups of people that we think should be doing things differently. So this caring with also, it's a bit of a complex quote there, but the basic idea is that we can also rephrase this definition of care to move away from humans to think about all the care work that is done by anybody, including spiritual kaitiaki or um, a plant, right? All of those, or, or an earthworm, are caring. So in the space of cultivate, we tried to think about who is caring for who. The interns are caring for a special part of the land, uh, but also they are being cared for by the staff, but also by that piece of land, right? It's a mutual care relationship. So the care work that is done by worms, I mentioned worms and microbes, sunlight, vegetables, water, hose, trees, gumboots, uh, are all important parts of the care. And one type of care space is a commons. And normally in uh, political theory and geographic theory, we talk about commons as being a space that is cared for by a collective of people. So they don't have to own it, but a collective of, collective of people are caring for a space and the primary benefits of that space go to that collective. So that's what a commons is. Uh, but when we start thinking about commons as a framework for care with the young people, uh, we can see that it's going two ways, right? They are performing the care for this space, but they're also receiving care from that space. So I'm just gonna flick through. This is about moving private property and open access resources into commons because commons have been shown to be one of the more successful ways of um, people assuming care of a space. Running out of time, so I'm just going to skip to this one here. So we sort of mapped how was the commons of cultivate being cared for, um, and who was doing the care work. And we have these different aspects of a commons, which include who accesses it, who uses it, who benefits from it, who cares for it, who takes responsibility, and who owns it. Uh, on that top bit there, we've got the things that make it a commons. It has shared and wide access, its use is negotiated by community, it's widely distributed benefit, performed care by community members, etc. And then down here, we sort of thought about who was doing the care work 
of the commons of cultivate. And we notice there is some non-humans doing significant care work there as well. Uh, but we can also see that the care is performed by the community members who include a community of the more than human or non-human. So to summarise that, the care of the commons is provided by the humans, like staff, uh, but the common space also cares for humans, which is getting into the benefits of green space, uh, and cares particularly for youth wellbeing and the surrounding community. Um, and this idea of caring with is what cultivates humans who have a relationship with urban ecology. So caring alongside um, other beings and paying attention to other beings is what makes people in the long term be interested in caring for the environment, which was a different way of saying something Yolanda already said just 20 minutes ago. So last thing, what does that mean for planning for urban restoration? I think one thing that we really need to consider in a lot more detail, this is my main point for today, is to think about how do we cultivate commons in our everyday urban environment. So the key point here is that if care is provided by commons, the key characteristics of a commons is mutual benefit. So it doesn't really work to have someone who's sacrificially uh, dedicating all their time to care for something um, and then ends up getting activist burnout. out. Um, or it doesn't really work if we think, oh, the council's in charge of that, it's not my problem, I don't really have to worry about it. So the idea with the commons is that it's a group of people caring for something collectively and also getting the benefits from that collectively. So the question I have to leave us with is, how can our urban restoration pro projects for indigenous species build in these mutual care or reciprocity practices? So that's a question that people might like to follow up more and I'd like to follow up more, actually. And I do think, in summary, we have a lot to learn from other traditions of commons because a lot of the theory I've been using in care theory is coming out of a sort of kaupapa pakia way of understanding the world. Uh, but we do know that many traditions have understandings of commons as being a collective human and more than human undertaking. It's not just humans caring for the environment or environment providing ecosystem services, but a mutual relationship, um, something like marriage, right? And that's the rest of my team. You can contact us about this project. And thank you for listening. Kia ora.